And then it just disappeared. Like nobody said Spicy Boys anymore. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Irenacast. I'm your host, Jeff, and with me is my co-host, Alan. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, we are going to be talking about the sovereignty of God, which I think will be a very interesting conversation between the two of us. And for our segment, we're going to be looking at a couple instances of wacky news this week. Uh, a little reprieve from probably the regular news cycle that we've all been exposed to. Let, let's get into our conversation this week. So we want to talk about God's sovereignty. And I think that this is an issue that we've touched on through various other issues. But I think that the issue in particular itself is is an important one. And I think it's also something that for many of us that have been in a more conservative evangelical framework uh, was kind of a big deal, whether it was framed as God's will or uh, God's reign over the earth or whatever. It, it's a way to help or try to help people figure out the balance between the good stuff in the world and the bad stuff in the world and how do you deal with suffering and all that kind of stuff. And for the most part, in my experience, became a cop out. In in my Pentecostal upbringing, the will of God was a really big deal. It was this ever present burden <laughs> that laid on me my entire or most of my my time in church because it was always this this constant journey to figure out what's God's will for your life what's God's will for your life it was communicated to me that there was this perfect line this perfect path that every decision hinged on whether you would end up down the right path or the wrong path like that you would always seek God's will whether it was for your spouse or future spouse or college or decision, even some people going as far as like praying before they eat breakfast each day to make sure that they, uh, <laughs> you know, or have God's will and everything. Putting on the right clothes. Right, exactly. And it wasn't until uh, probably late high school that my Sunday school teacher gave me this book. And it was probably the most freeing experience I had in an, in an evangelical context. I, I've read the book since then. It's not that great. But for me, it was important then. It was called uh, Decision Making and the Will of God. And it really opened things up for me and allowed me to think beyond the fact that there was this one right decision for me in everything and realizing that there was this wider path to God's will. And it was helpful for me at that time. And now I've probably widened the path so much that it's just more of an open field, but <laughs> we'll get into that as we discuss that. Uh, so Alan, what has been your experience with the idea of sovereignty or God's will? I can relate to some of that. In my context, it was more about protecting the deity of God. How can you worship a God that's not completely in control or determining everything that happens? Um, let's say something bad happens in the world. If God's not in control at that moment, then what are we doing? Worshiping, of course, him. That can probably be traced a little bit further back to uh, medieval Christianity and the development of thinking about God and how God interacts with the world. Without getting too much into it just now, it kind of fully blossomed and developed through all these theological wars to the point where when I was growing up, it was assumed that like to be a real Christian, you had to believe that God determined everything that happened, like everything. You can, you know, praise God because uh, there's good intended for us through all the suffering that we go through. And so um, now I, of course, believe that God can use all things and can use all situations and can bring good from suffering. But I don't believe God intends suffering in the way that I was taught growing up. I was taught something called concurrence, and that is God is uh, acting at the same time we are acting. So God is willing the things that are <laughs> – this is, I think, maybe where you and I differed. I was like a hardcore Calvinist in my uh, upbringing. That's what we were. And uh, we were taught that like uh, even you sinning was doing the will of God because God had predestined the whole world, the whole, all of history to happen the way that it happens. And so there's like the, the, the special will and the other type of will. There's two different types of wills of God. God wants the best for everyone, but God is also authoring a world where there's like sin, you know, sin is allowed and stuff. And so God is acting at each and every moment, making things happening. And so there's a concurrence of activity, which is just fascinating now that I look back at it. But there were, there was some of that language too. It was, there was that, that path, the permissive will of God and the actual will of God, right? Like these are the things God right. allows, but it's not really for. And those, those, that was always used to justify certain like parts of the Bible when 
a horrible right. mistake was made. Well, you know, that's part of God's permissive will. And there, and there's like a pre, and there's a predetermined will. Like God's will is that the whole of history should happen this way and it's going to happen no matter what. That was what one way of understanding God's will was. And then as far as like God's revealed will, it was like, you should be good to each other, you know, and you should worship God. And I think that served the two functions you just mentioned. It helped people in struggling through really difficult moments in their life and some people. And then on the other hand, it protected God from being questioned, you know, like what what's God doing when bad things happen? Well, God's still in control and God still has a plan for it. And it was purposed from forever. But yeah, that, that that's how I grew up. I'd love to talk more about like where I'm at now, but yeah, my background was protecting God. <laughs> we didn't care so much about whether, you know, you were, you were adapting well to the theology. We just wanted to know the real theology and protect God's deity was kind of more the program that I would, grew up with <laughs> that's so funny to me well the whole thing of god's will is funny to me now but th that idea and, and that's prevalent through a lot of evangelicalism that idea of protecting god or god's way or right. the bible as if god would need some sort of protection god well god does the god of evangelicals does <laughs> true <laughs> there's been a, some big things that have happened in the past 200 years people used to talk about god's sovereignty back in the middle ages in the sense that god um, like preserves the whole universe. Everything exists because God is consciously willing it to exist. And I probably still am there with those Christian thinkers. I do believe God is the, is the basis of existence and that everything comes and is given rise because of God. You know, everything depends upon God and God's sovereign in the sense that God doesn't need anything else to exist. Like you and I need God to exist. We even need food and water and all that stuff. Uh, God doesn't need anything to exist. God's like the primary first being. And in that sense, God's free in a way that people probably aren't. It's an interesting point. But they also believed in things like concurrence, like all of history was authored by God and it was moving in a certain certain way. Um, the things that called that into question, that called like the medieval reformers into question, that was Calvin, by the way, and some of the other early medieval reformers, um, was things like Darwin the the development of Darwinian evolution and discovering like the role of chance and in evolution and all that stuff really called into question um, what God's sovereignty looks like. And there were still lots of Christians at that point when like Darwinianism was um, developing that still thought, yeah, God is still sovereign. And uh, the mechanism for the world developing the way that it was, was God just gave people freedom right? Gave the universe freedom for it to develop. But then you look at World War One and Two, like you just, you progress through Christian theology. After World War One and Two, it was like, well, in what sense is God in control? If World War One can happen and millions of people can kill each other and gas each other and invade stuff and like the world is so awful and the Holocaust can happen, in what real sense do we even say God's in control? So there's been like really big crises of theology for Christians over the last 100 or 150 years. I think with those two big shifts happening, one was like questioning on a scientific basis and one's questioning it on like an evidentiary basis. How can we even tell if God is active in the world if it's so awful? Right. And not only that, but I think that specifically within our cultural context here in America, it also has to do with the change of perspective towards authority in our country, specifically since uh, probably Nixon, where there's this erosion of trust or even just any kind of like awe of, of leadership. Because I think that a lot of this sovereignty language is also coming from the biblical language, which was very hierarchical. You know, God is king. God is, you know, especially if you go through the, the Hebrew scriptures and the idea of a theocracy and God being in charge and authority being authority. And you either had good authority or bad authority and everyone suffered the consequences of it. There was never this notion of, revolt, it was God will take care of it. God will either overthrow this leader or overthrow that leader. And the idea of democracy and the people's voice wasn't something that was in the cultural conscience of anyone during the time in which scripture was being written. So I think that right. holding scripture too literally then eliminates that whole idea. And there's no, there's no context for how we work today, where we can speak out, where we have a voice. So you're saying that the cultural situation of the authors of the Old and New Testaments, like saw God in monarchical terms, like a, like a king 
because that's what they knew right when it came to leadership and that there are different ways of envisioning god once you get out of that cultural context exactly because in that context your leader had to have a certain amount of sovereignty right I mean, really, does it right? Does it does it matter? I mean, ever since Hammurabi, it's been like that. Exactly. I mean, I've, yeah. So of course, There's God clear. is going to be framed in those terms. But the question I have is, do we need to continue to frame God in those terms? And does it matter to the extent in which we think or communicate God's power or sovereignty or control over the world or us individually? And maybe we don't need to use those terms or use those images in our language any longer in order to create a relatable conversation about who God is and how God interacts with the world and people. Um, one of the guys I studied in the seminary, Pannenberg, he actually makes the case that it's a still really important conversation in the sense that not as God micromanaging everything that's happening right now, but at the end of like our, our world is history producing like the purpose that God created it for is is like the universe headed in that direction and in the christian terms like the the eschaton the last things community community with god redemption if history is not headed in that direction then we can't properly call god god which is really interesting i still think it's important to think about god as sovereign in the sense that god is giving rise to all of existence and without god we don't exist the other way around doesn't work. Like without us, God could still exist. I think that's an important like dependency sort of argument. But so, so my problem with that is what does dependency have to do with control, right? So I, right. my children are dependent upon me. Without me, they're not going to survive. They're going to wander the streets as four-year-old little girls and probably not make it too far. So their dependence doesn't require me to provide them for a specific future. My their dependence on me is a temporary dependence, right? That dependence is I've created this for you, and now I'm allowing you to move forward into it and become and discover who you are. Is that life? Yeah, is but as far as existence goes, that can never change. I mean, like that's a maybe the metaphor fails because, like, without God, we can't exist. That's the basis of all existence. The ground of our being would be God. And uh, true, but why does that have to have? Why does that have to also include sovereignty? Even well, even that's just it, one sense of sovereignty. Like sovereignty has a couple different senses. In one sense, that that is like preservation. God is preserving all of because if God just stopped, nothing exists. Okay, there's an active force of God allowing everything to exist or giving rise to it. And then if you're going to talk about like government, like governing the the universe or not, I think that's like a separate issue. How exactly? I I don't think the question is whether or not God is acting or exercising power, but how does God do it? Uh, the process theologians think that God never has coercive control over anyone, that all God ever does is invite people. The spirit of God invites people to wholeness and health and like following after Christ, right? And never coerces anyone into doing anything. And I don't know if I'm necessarily there. Stanley Grenz in the community of God, that's another book I had in, in a seminary. This is where it comes down to for me. Separates the sovereignty of God in de jure and de facto sovereignty. De jure means according to the law. So, like, technically, God could literally do whatever God wants to because our existence is dependent upon God. Gives as as the old you know, the Hebrew Bible and Romans say says, uh, "We're the potter, we're the clay, and God is the potter." God has created us. We belong to God, um, and so God has the right to exert sovereignty at any moment. But as far as de facto sovereignty, that's like actually coercing creation to do what God wants. I don't see that that's how God has set up the universe. I don't think that there's an exercise de facto, but that de jure, like the uh, the right at any moment to do with creation what God wants to, I think still exists. And I think that's important, in, at least in my relationship with God. What, what does that add to your experience as a human being or your spiritual journey that makes it that important? Some people talk about our relationship with God as being interdependent, like God depends on us. I haven't studied that a whole lot to figure out exactly what they mean by that, but and that would be process theologians. Um, I think there is like a back and forth between us and God. We do have freedom to to ch make choices. We've been given agency by God, and God um, interacts with us in like a – not a simple but like a multifaceted way. Uh, it's important to me to remember that. God is still the potter and I am still the clay because it 
uh, orients my relationship. Creature, creature and creator, you know? Yes, I'm being invited into the interdependence, into the um, into community with God. And yes, I have an effect on God. Uh, all of that happens. And yes, I have freedom to make my choices and decisions. Um, and the universe has the freedom to develop. That's what I do believe. But I still think that uh, cr- the creator and creature divide is unbridgeable. I think that, yes, we can have deep, deep, f- deep, meaningful communion, but God is not a creature and I am not the creator. I think there's like a fundamental difference between the universe and God. And I, I, I think that that's probably a really traditional way to look at it, but it's what orients my relationship and it's why I interact with God the way I do. So do you think that God's agenda ever trumps agency? Occasionally. I would say in, in general, no, but I, I would say that in my life and, and I would look at the old test, the Hebrew Bible and the new Testament. And I would say, I can't say no, I can't say that never happens because it, it, uh, it looks like it. (laughs) Interesting. I, I believe. And so that's why I'm not a process theologian. If I thought that God was never coercive and never acted against us or never, you know, always allowed agency and never infringed upon anyone's rights, like I would be like a um, process theologian. And I'm not quite there. I'm more of an open theist, which is like God, there's an open future and God is letting us make our decisions. And that's necessary for our moral development. And also for the development of the universe, there has to be some freedom. I used to think that God was leading history toward its conclusion and pulling it like kicking and screaming, you know, through the desert toward the promised land and that it would happen. And that's how God led everyone. And so that's kind of how my pastoral ministry was too. you know, follow me. I'm going to show you the way. This is how you do it. You live like me and I'm going to live like Christ. And um, I'm going to be like a little Moses in the wilderness. And now I think it's a little different. I think there's a lot more freedom in the way that God interacts with the universe and a lot more, I would say, more loving way that God interacts with the universe, which allows for people to have their own agency and decisions. Well, there there are certain physical limits to our own agency, right? Like I, I don't right. have complete freedom. I can't say, well, today I'm going to decide to have the powers of Superman and be able to fly wherever I want. So there's that. I don't know. I don't know what you call it or what theologians have called it, but there's this natural limitations, limitations that have been put yeah. there when it comes to that particular issue. And, you know, we believe God created the universe and everything. So God placed those, those things that trump our agenda to a certain point. And then there are, you know, earthly powers or whatever that (laughs) further trump our agenda as far as, you know, not killing people, you know, good things and laws and all that kind of stuff. Those exceptions aside, what what would be an instance? Natural limitations. Natural limitations or, you know, cultural limitations, depending upon our place in the world or whatever. And if we believe that God instituted those those authorities, which we can get into (laughs) in a little bit. Uh, you think that aside from those things, there are still times where God would intervene past those institutions, natural or government, and override your agenda or free will or whatever, or agency for God's agenda. I don't know if override would be the way, but oppose it probably. Through what would that look like, things. though? Through those same things, maybe. Okay. I don't know. Balaam is going to curse. <laughs> now these are story. This is a story, right? But Balaam goes to curse Israel, and the donkey turns around. Or um, the king is uh, of Babylon is an ass, and literally gets turned into a beast by God, and is opposed in that way. I've had things happen in my life that are like happenstance or maybe miraculous, and I think that. Maybe they could be explained if they were looked at from a certain angle. You could explain it in all natural ways, but I still believe it's like God acting. So I don't know exactly how this gets into the question of divine action. How does divine action in the world? Does God act in the world? Does God just influence people through the spirit to like uh, to make their own decisions? And that's the only way God interacts with our world. Or is there more ways, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think because everything arises from God, the physical properties and limitations that you're talking about are actually expressions of God preserving the universe, giving the physical stuff what it is. I think that any action of God can be just looked at as a natural thing because all that stuff is arising from God. But like breaking the laws of physics and I don't know if you have to necessarily get there to like cover what I'm thinking of. 
But as far as coercive control, yeah, I think God opposes people and puts stuff in, in the way, you know, I think that does happen. Um, and that's not something that I've totally figured out. This is definitely a question that I'm in the middle of processing. Right. That's why I'm like reading process theology books and like kind of going through what do I think about God and how God interacts with the world. But for me, I still believe and think it's important that God is sovereign. Maybe that, maybe that, maybe that's what it is though, is that God as sovereign versus God as micromanaging and determining all things. Cause I don't believe that. I don't believe it's a de facto sovereignty. I think that there are things that happen in the world right now that God doesn't want. <laughs> like I think the Holocaust was bad that God didn't want that to happen or that a certain person is doing certain things in office right now. I don't, say that God wanted that to happen and God has put him in charge and we should follow him. And like, I don't use that kind of rhetoric that you, that comes from the, um, the monarchical way of looking at things that you were talking about. Where am I going with all this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And and I think that that's why we're kind of having that conversation is because I think that, I mean, if I was going to put a, a term on it, which, you know, my aversion to doing that in the first place, um, mm-hmm. I would probably consider myself more of a process theologian because, right. I, I certainly lean that way. And that could be my propensity towards um, pretty much always disagreeing with authority and having issues in that area <laughs> um, myself. Uh, and the idea of a grand puppet master, you know, <laughs> putting everything right. in place and, you know, using us as chess pieces and all that kind of stuff. Even when you say, like, God could do this at any moment or whatever, that 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 even irks me, like that whole idea bothers me because I think that more than anything, and again, this goes to, I think how people use it because ultimately none of us are ever going to know. And that's true for all these theological issues that we bring up. But my biggest problem is with how people use some kind of doctrine of sovereignty of God to keep people in their place, to dismiss other people, to we're watching it right now to totally go back on decades of where you stand and what you believe on and sacrifice it just because the right now you want the right leader and to, to use, you know, to talking about Trump and the evangelicals and how they've, or how many have voiced their approval of everything that's going on and, you know, using things like, you know, old using Hebrew stories of bad leaders that God placed there and that's okay. And like all that. <laughs> oh, stuff. that's what you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's horrendous, you know, I mean, and, and this is the place that we live in. And, and I think that it has been used over and over again because these people set themselves up as authorities in their sometimes genuine desire and sometimes just learn behavior because of the the culture that they're in within evangelicalism set themselves up as the authority of God right. by the way that they talk about seeking God's will or whatever. And I think it's horrible. And I've noticed that in my time in more progressive church settings, it's not an issue. It's not something that's talked about like God's sovereignty. It's something that's alluded to because of the liturgy and it's just part of the language, but it's never something that's talked to, or at least in my experience, because, and I think that's a good thing because it's more about what well, we're doing something in the world. And that's enough yeah as one guy said it one one guy put it to me uh in evangelical churches it's more like let's all get together and discover what god wants us to do what's the will of god whereas in more like liberal churches it's or more mainline hey let's all do the good work and invite god to be a part of it and so like there's like this distinct th- difference between the two as far as practice goes right and i love the healthy tension between both because it's so easy to assume that i'm doing what god would want me to do I can convince myself of that all day, every day of the week. People who supported refugee bans and this tax bill and all that stuff, they're convincing themselves they're doing God's will. Right. Right. And so I can do that, too. So I think it is important to have communal discernment as to, like, what God does want, you know, or what God. And that that right there bothers some people, the idea of God even wanting some things. But I think. It's a basic Christian affirmation to show that, like, Jesus being the image of God made visible, that God had an aversion for some things and not others, you know, injustice, that there is a a divine will, that God does want community, that God does want wholeness for people. I do believe that. And no, I don't think God determines everything that happens, even though I do believe God is in control, quote unquote. That's fascinating. That's really interesting. What do I mean by like in control? 
because it used to be like God's in control. So everything that ever happens to you, like there's a purpose to all of it. Right. And uh, I would never take that away from someone if someone had a death in their family or something horrible happened. I would, and they thought that it was comforting that God was in control and this was for a purpose or a reason. I would never be like, excuse me, but that's bad theology. <laughs> like, right. You know, a better way to look at it. I would never do that. And I would never take that away from someone. But I am of the mind that God uses everything, even the less than the best, even the bad stuff that God will use it for good, but not that God intended it, not that God wanted it or purposed it, you know? And and I would say those same things, but instead of saying God uses or God would do this, I would just say we have a choice whether we want to bring meaning to things that happen or not. And it has nothing to do with anyone else but the decisions that we choose to make within that situation. And I think that uh, too many times God's control or God's God's control, not God's presence, because I think that sometimes people, they interchange the two, which I think is a big, big, big problem. Um, yeah. But because God's presence is is there, but God's control has nothing to do with it. It has to do with things happen and we react and we've been given a way, a mindset, a spirit to tap into during those moments that can push us through and allow something good to come from it. But it, but it's still it's still a decision. It's still something we choose to enter into or not to enter into. And there's not a moment where if we choose not to enter into it, we can't enter into it later, which I think is another problem when it comes to control and rhetoric surrounding God's will is it makes you feel like there's these moments. And if you miss them, then it's too late because the plan's already in 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 motion. Weird. <laughs> I never I think we I think we probably conceived of God's sovereignty differently. In our background. I think so. <laughs> it sounds, sounds like it. That whole like weird uh, – it's almost like uh, – do you know um, the movie Donnie Darko um, where there's like that invisible little like tunnel coming out of their chest showing where they're going to move? Right. It's like you've got this like crazy little tunnel going everywhere that is God's will and if you step outside of it, you're lost in the flow forever. Like that is we- – that's weird. I I don't think we ever thought about it that way. It was more like it doesn't matter what you do, you're just a, literally acting out what God's already written down from <laughs> eternity, which is I think even creepier and probably more stilted. You know what I mean? Like how can God oppose sin but like winky face still like enact it, you know, and still do it? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. I don't that two-handedness is something that um that doesn't sit well with me. And that's why I have problem with language of authority and power when it comes to that. Yeah. Because once the power is given, then all that other stuff goes with it. And there's almost, you know, unless you're a Democrat that is pro-life, uh, all leaders have been chosen and you just need to accept the whole thing. And I think that the problem with that is that it makes it feel like established authority. And if you go against that authority, then you're going against God, which is explicitly said a lot of times within certain right. religious contexts. And I think so that, the, the, the cure for that, the cure for that for me, theologically speaking, is to like really inflate our understanding of agency, really meditate on how much freedom there appears to be in the universe for us to make decisions for stuff to develop by chance. And like, Bring that into our theology. I think the Dar- Darwinian shift was a gift to us, you know? But you know my it problem with like, that is, is, is within that, I think that that's possible and I think that's a good thing. But I think that it is impossible if you hold tightly to the idea of depravity, the, the depravity of humans. If we are constantly using language that says we're nothing and we're only here because of God and God is our only salvation and there's nothing in us that's good. All of our good comes from God itself. And we, we highlight depravity over everything. Then I think it makes it impossible for us to fully embrace freedom and not only just embrace freedom individually, but allow space for others to exercise their freedom, even when it goes against where we're at. That's like, yeah, for me, that's a different topic as far as like, (laughs) <laughs> undoing the whole concept of depravity and original sin and all that kind of stuff. Um, human freedom and the moral development that comes from that, the freedom to to make choices, to make mistakes, to do all of that stuff uh, is a part of how the God created the universe. I can affirm that within a context of sovereignty. Expand on that a little bit, what you mean by that. Like you look at the freedom for people to make their own choices and decisions and there's, there's tons of decisions that are all 
like there's not one special way to go. Like you actually have the freedom to choose what you're going to do. Uh, that's the way God intended the universe to be when God created everything. And so God sustaining that system. So our agency itself is dependent upon God allowing us and sustaining us as beings to be able to make those decisions. But they're in fact free and they're in fact like it was God's will to have such a diverse world of people who of people who make different decisions and don't all look don't all look alike. So basically God owns this building and he opened up a large loft for any artist to come in and express themselves any way that they want. He's provided the space for people to have free will and creativity and, and agency. And that space is eternal. He's not going to evict anyone, but, but it, it, it breaks down because that metaphor breaks down because, well, all metaphors God break is, down. <laughs> yeah. I think God's still present in all of this. Like God is present at every moment. And it, and I do agree with some process like theology that God is inviting us at every moment. There is this invitation toward community with God and with the universe. Um, and all we have to do is like stop and listen for a second and we hear it. You know, I think that there's, there's truth to that. And so it's not as if God just spun the watch and then just let it go or that's Newtonian, just set up the universe and allowed for uh, chaos and then just let it go and knew that something would develop. I think that God's still present at every moment. And so that presence does matter. There is an influencing effect on the universe, um, but it's not always in a way that like de facto God gets what God wants at every moment. It's like we're computers that are programmed to do exactly what God wants us to do. Cause to me, that's not love or right. Well, not to know my experience, but if mm -hmm. our space influences our decision. So if God created that space, then that space itself can act as what you're talking about that idea of yeah and when we can inf and we can influence each other right and exactly. we influence each other i mean i have freedom to influence other people and that affects their agency so yeah i i think that there's that there's secondary causes that, you know that's a stuff. that's a good word I, I like influence as opposed to control because it it, it insinuates yeah. a a give and take and insinuates a relationship It insinuates an, a, an intermingling at, at a certain level. And, and it, the, the influence is exactly what it is. I mean, if you look at all the Hebrew and Christian scriptures we have, they themselves are supposed to influence people. They're like written to influence people. And there's like this sense that God has a special sort of relationship with humanity, that it's not just one way. There is a give and take. There is a debating like, you know, Abraham debating God down and Israel wrestling with God. Like that's the whole monotheistic, at least from a Jewish background um, project is this wrestling with God that, 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 that still exists. And I think that that's important for us to remember, uh, you know, specifically us because we're uh, you know, we're working in church settings and we're, we're leadership over people. And then even in the context of the show, we're, we're a voice to a certain amount of, of people and recognizing that your your voice and your your space is not a place to exercise authority, but it's it's a place to to offer a certain amount of influence and always holding right. it loosely enough to recognize and being aware and being open to when you've you've crossed the line from influence to coercion or yeah. uh, or whatever whatever word we want to put in there. And I think that that's kind of that's that. well said. Yeah. And we, and we become like God, right? Right. We are the way God is in this world. That's from, I think, First Peter. And uh, as I've let go of those images of God dragging the whole world and instead of giving more freedom, my pastoral like work has changed. It's been less about just leading everybody out front and more about partnership on the paths that different people are on that may be, may be different than mine. We may disagree about stuff, but being like a faithful partner and um, catalyst for stuff with people is a totally different perspective. And um, one one question I have. So the, the, I guess this is something I need solved for myself. The sticky point is that if I believe God does intervene at different moments in like a extra special way, right? So like stuff happens and God is supporting everything. Like we'll just call it the natural world or the natural consequences and stuff. But I believe that things have happened in my life that are like miraculous, that God has so – God's spirit has somehow worked and intervened in certain situations. Why doesn't God always do that? Why doesn't God stop really bad stuff from happening? If God can, 
why, why doesn't God? That's the question. If God is all powerful and all good, then how can God let bad things happen? You know, I, th- um, I think it's I think it's more comforting if it's either or. I think the problem is, is the, the idea of exceptions. So we talk about we don't believe that generally, but there are times where where God will, you know, worm God's way in and be like, OK, well, in this case, I'll, you know, I'll prevent you from getting a car wreck. But, you know, we'll keep the gas chambers in World War Two going like all that stuff. And I think that that goes down to. And and this is where I've landed in this particular thing because I think it goes back to authority. It goes back to influence is there are certain things that happen to me and physically my brain is going to create a narrative to kind of put things back in a box to make sure that my whole world doesn't go out of whack. But also I think that there are things that are personal and we can accept that this might happen to us. I think that line is crossed is when you take your influence and you you project those individual experiences and the conclusions that you've made about them and you impose them onto everyone else and say, it was true for me. It's going to be true for you. It takes away any nuance that we might have and any agency that we might have to believe something that on paper sounds ridiculous, but really gives us comfort and gives us a place to rest while we live the rest of our life to maybe reframe that and reshape it. Because there are, there are instances in my life where if you would have asked me, was this a miracle? I would say yes. And then six months to two years later, I would say, no, not really, because I have this new experience. And then if you asked me like four years after that, I'd be like, well, yeah, I think it kind of was. So I think that those moments in our life are not places to make theological declarations about who God is. Those are moments that are constantly being reframed as we live our life. And we need to give people the space to reframe those moments. And when we when we enact our influence or our authority on someone and say, no, this is it then I think that creates even more disunity in that person's own life because we've told them there's only one way to view that place and not to reevaluate it. That it happened and right. that's the way it is, period. Yeah, yeah, I, I get that. And that's really well said about our, dif- our understandings evolving of our own experiences. But to say that God influences or acts in the world at all is to say that God doesn't stop really bad stuff. And you either have to say God can't or God won't. You know what I mean? Like that's that's the traditional conundrum. If if God is active in our world, like why is all this bad stuff happening? And uh, the only thing I can think of is that God has really allowed for human freedom in a really big capital F way, freedom for us to do stuff. It's not either or. I mean, like it doesn't have to be. We're we're accountable to God, not the other way around. And that makes me sound like I'm back <laughs> growing up in oh my gosh, more conservative circles. But that's that's what it is. Is like God's not accountable f- to me for the decisions that God makes. I can get angry. I can respond a certain way or ask God, why didn't you stop this from happening? I can do all that without saying you know God couldn't or something like that. You know what I mean? Right. And and for some people, they put that limitation on God because it helps them. No, no, I can't say why they do that, but I can see that it would help some people to think that God can't because God has really limited God's self to not acting coercively in the world just by influencing people. I can see how that would solve that for them. But for me, I I have a more messy view of God, Jeff. It's not like it's not Greek and clean anymore. You know, it's not like immutable, this, that, that all these categories and God is just those things. Like the more I study the ancients relationship with, with God and what they knew about God in the old and new testaments. And the more I live with real people right now and in my own life, the more messy it all gets is I do believe that there's more of a back and forth between us and God. And it's very real to me. I do believe that that is happening. It's hard for me to just explain it, but I still hold on to God being God, you know? Right. I, I, I think my, my, at this point, my theology is, is a Psalm. I'll go one minute, be like, yes, God, you're working. <laughs> God is love to be like, why have you forgotten us? Where are you? What's going on? <laughs> right, I hate you. Right. Get out of my face. And then back to, <laughs> oh, God is love and all that kind of stuff. And I think that that's, that's the, the kind of the beauty of it. Because if we're going to go like with the whole idea that every single human has been made in the image of God and reflects a part of who God is, that's a very diverse and messy landscape. Right. And as we experience everything in life, it's going to shape and affect our view of who God is. And I think that it needs to be more pliable than 
we as church leaders maybe communicate it sometimes. And I think that that allowing space for people to hold those things in tension and change their view and not, you know, not make declarations about who got it. But I like the word, you know, you talk about process theology, which is why I'm drawn to it, is the idea of inviting people into something and listening to multiple voices because we may not be wanted we may not want to be invited to that party, but that party looks a little bit better because it's more uh relevant to our situation and where we are right now. But maybe not next time. I, I think community's the um community's the goal. Right. Of God's like of God's quote unquote sovereignty. I think that's like the will or the 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 destination. And even in that, even when we get there, it's going to be messy. You know what I mean? Community itself is not not right or wrong, not sin or righteousness. It's just messy regardless if you're doing right or wrong. It doesn't matter. Community is messy. And God's relationship with us is messy in my mind because it is community. It's like real community. And quite honestly, it's one-sided. Like all of our relationship and ideas about who God is, when you break it down to its you know, smallest fraction is conjecture. It, it's 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 guessing based off the best knowledge that we have in certain areas and our own experience and the experience of others. Now we're going to talk about epistemology and how we know stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's an episode for another day. Yeah, we'll oh we'll save gosh. that for <laughs> an upcoming episode. Um, but let us let us know what you think. Add your voice to this particular conversation. You can comment on the show notes at Irenicast. Tell us. Sorry. I also want them to tell us that we've totally misunderstood process theology and educate us. That's right. Out of your theological depth. For sure. To explain why process theology is the way to go. Exactly. Let us know where your <laughs> theology is. Let us know anything about this particular conversation. The last couple episodes, we've had some great feedback in the comments on the show notes. So um, to, to add your voice to this conversation, the show notes are at irenacast.com slash 107. And there in the show notes, you also find all the relevant links and a complete list of all the other ways to like, follow, and contact the show. That's irenacast.com slash 107. I particularly like uh, one of the comments that we got in our last episode that talked about um, sincerity and insincerity in terms of power and how insincerity is a means of holding on to power. And that was what underlying the conversation for one person was something to look at. So if you want to look at that, look at the comment on last episode. Super good. Yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you, Emily, for your comment on last week's episode. Uh, it, which is those comments, I think at this point are especially even more important to hear from our listeners since we are, we are down a voice with, uh, yes. Mona, Mona no longer a regular on the show and us being two, you know, <laughs> two, two white guys, um, adding to the, the overabundance of two white guys talking about white religious Christian issues. Males. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I think, that, you know, again, that becomes more important as we go on. We love to hear from everyone who's listening and, uh, you know. Take the gloves off if you need to. We're not, we're not always right. We want to we want to hear the good and bad. Um, all right. So uh, on the other side of the music, we are going to be looking at a few items of wacky news. I think at one point I realized that this particular segment, wacky news, is. Um, wacky news. Yeah, it's it's kind of difficult to tell the difference between wacky news and real news and fake news these days, um, <laughs> because everything seems so absurd. Preach it. But we're gonna try anyway. So we we've compiled a couple news items that we've seen, and uh, that hopefully will bring us some some joy and some levity in our lives, as opposed to the real news cycle, which at least for the hosts of this show is been depressing and <laughs> probably what motivated this idea of uh, secretly hoping that God did have some sort of control and would bring down fire <laughs> or something. I heavens. don't know. Open up That's the right. heavens, Isaiah 64, and come down, quake the mountains. I have to double check every time I see a uh, post on Facebook about some news event, whether or not it's that Andy guy from The New Yorker who writes satire. I don't know his name, Andy something. But I always have to double check because I have to make sure that it's not satire. Oh, my and gosh. And it's usually not. It's usually it's not. not. Nope. I, okay, I'm just going to say one of them. I know we shouldn't be talking about this person on air, but making fun of someone for their like ethnic heritage in front of an Andrew Jackson painting while trying to like uh, honor the Native American talkers, like the Navajo wind talkers from World War II. 
and then calling uh, another politician Pocahontas in the middle of that. You can't write that. Nobody would believe it if you would have written it for like an SNL sketch. Everyone it's would say, ridiculous. well, that's a little too far. Yeah. <laughs> I can't believe it. It's just beyond comprehension for me. Everything. Or his tweet a couple weeks ago where he, you know, said, well, I didn't, you know, I don't know why Kim Jong-un called me old when I didn't say anything about him being fat. Like this, <laughs> like what, what the hell? How does this, how does this even make like the, the conversation of the, the, the quote unquote elite of our country? And ah, uh, it is. Yeah. Yeah, Let, it's pretty bad. Gosh, it's ridiculous. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Everyone's just like so upset all the time. We need to do something. <laughs> we do. Because it, it is upsetting. It active. is so upsetting. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, let's. Rather than uh, just let, influencing to try to influence people, we should actually act. And, and our action with this segment is distraction. <laughs> yes, it is. And there's some good ones. I'm excited about this. I love wacky news. All right, Alan. I'm, let's start with you then. Okay. Uh, well, it's not exactly a news segment, but it's news to me. So I wanted to, to share it with everyone else. Uh, there is a group called Super Deluxe. It's a uh, kind of like a BuzzFeed. It's like a social media conglomerate kind of. Like you know, they have an office or something. And they work at creating content for people. And it's usually like built on memes and <laughs> – the, the whole awful internet culture and that's how they get all of their views like for instance they're like the buzz cut's coming back it's not it's like satire right but there's this guy getting a, bu- a, bu- a bowl cut with a bowl on top of his head and then they're like cutting it and they make it look super nice like it's an actual thing and you kind of believe it's true but it's not really anyway they do a lot of stuff like that i saw them this last week uh host a Facebook live event where they had a video and they had a 1,500 people watching a real dog posing as a Tamagotchi pet. You know, Tamagotchi, those little, like, uh, those little, those pets little that virtual you pets chain, from the nineties yeah. where you like feed them and stuff. So they set it up. They had this like green room and they set it up, the dogs in there and it's got cheesy graphics, eight bit music, and everybody votes on what to like press on the Tamagotchi menu based on how they react to the video. And so the, if you want to give the dog water, everyone have to press the smiley face. If you want to give the dog a treat, everyone has to press like the, the crying face. And so everyone's like voting. And there's this dog that's like this virtual Tamagotchi pet for these 1,500 people when it's a real dog. <laughs> and so <laughs> it gets like treats. And if you have to donate money to be able to to choose how to do stuff, and so people would donate five bucks to a Venmo, they could like put in a plushy toy for the dog to play with, <laughs> or like there's a cutout in the bottom of the the wall where someone could reach their hand through and pet the dog. <laughs> I don't know how I feel about that. That feels like uh, it feels like kind of like animal abuse <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, that, like the like, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I feel like that's ripe for some sort of uh, PETA protest or anything like that. That's what some people were saying. My goodness. <laughs> and the people do were like, please don't sue us. They're using a like, machine voice. <laughs> right. Because well, was there any the, guidelines? Like, because with those Tamagotchi. Really happy. Please, his dog's really happy. Please don't sue us. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. It feels like, remember, uh, remember the old uh, Zelda games where you could like hit the chickens with your sword yeah and, you know you'd be like, you just do stuff in a game that was just dumb because you you could so i don't i don't know like to relate a real life dog to a game where most people like a lot of people would like like see how fast they could get their dog to die and all that kind of stuff i feel like that there's a <laughs> there's a dangerous potential that could happen with something like that when we replicate a game in, in real life because we've been conditioned to do Dumb things because we can teach their own, though, I guess, sort of. All right. So wacky, wacky. It is wacky. So here is my um, it's along the same lines has to do with animals. So here's the headline. English firefighters save some piglets from a blaze. Then they (laughs) ate them as sausages. Oh, I heard about that. Oh, my gosh. I heard about that. So I guess way back in so way back in February, uh, these English firefighters, they rescued 18 baby pigs and two sows from a burning barn. And the farm manager, uh, grateful for their response, promised a little gift. And about nine months later, they received <laughs> the pigs that they saved in sausage form. 
and uh, the firefighters had a barbecue. <laughs> That's so disgusting. <laughs> That's so gross. I, I brought this one I can't. mainly because of your uh, yeah, <laughs> vegetarian I, ways. <laughs> you know, I, I'm really calm when it comes to vegetarian stuff. I don't judge other people. But like that, that just like crisis of conscious stuff, you know, like – that's so wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. Like, why save those pigs? Just that takes away any power of the whole like salvation motif of saving these pigs. You're like saving them from a fire to put them in your mouth. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's not. Oh my god! I don't know. I can't like, take it. It, it. You're you're making a judgment on their purpose in life, Alan. <laughs> oh, see now that's hey talking about the will of God. That's good. These animals' purposes are to be eaten. Says you, dude. What the <laughs> hell? <laughs> That's why God put them on Earth. Are you kidding me? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> uh. <laughs> I hear that all the time. You know that? That's that's why they exist to be eaten. Well, it's it's kind of why those particular ones existed. They were on a farm and they were gonna be killed. So you know, why not? Why not partake? <laughs> Oh my God! Don't you think? Like, well, I it, hope they got worms. Don't you think in in that moment that <laughs> that that to know that you had a hand in that delicious meal more than just cooking it would add Ooh. to the <laughs> you saved that baby and now you're eating it. <laughs> That's so gross. Don't don't say baby. Don't use humanizing terms towards these animals okay, that are bred piglet. for our food. <laughs> Sorry, they're as smart as like five year olds. But yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. Oh <laughs> Do you have another one? I'm traumatized. It just makes me scared. The firemen are going to come into my house and, you know, and, <laughs> and eventually <laughs> eat the animals that they like, say they have good. Do they have good morals. Like, come on. Uh, there's a used car commercial uh, selling a 1996 Honda, <laughs> Honda Accord. And this like film guy was trying to make make a portfolio for the job he's applying for so as a joke he recorded a car commercial of this 1996 honda accord and so in it it has his girlfriend like opening up her used like car sitting in there like doing all the stuff you would see in a real car commercial Mm -hmm. and the back the voiceover says you're different you do things your way you don't need things. You're happy with who you are. You don't care about money. Like trying to sell this used car to everybody who's watching. Totally professionally done. Super hilarious. Uh, and then it says, introducing a used 1996 Honda Accord, a car for people who have life figured out and just need a way to get somewhere. <laughs> Luxury is a state of mind. And it's like a really crappy car. But it has like driving, you know, on the, like by the coast and there's no tread on the tires. It's really, really funny. Uh, it just sold. It sold after going viral. Everyone loved this video on YouTube. CarMax bought it for twenty thousand dollars. <laughs> a used nineteen ninety six Accord for twenty thousand dollars. It's pretty cool. Well, anyway, I love that video. You guys have to go watch it. All right. So this one is it's it's a little old. It's dated. So it's it's from two thousand sixteen, and it's a it's a petition that was put out there. That got 58,708 signers. I guess their goal was 150,000. So they missed it by close to 100,000. But still, almost 60,000 people signed this petition to rename Fire Ants to Spicy Boys. <laughs> I don't know why I found that funny. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like it came from some YouTube video. Someone was trying to get everybody to do it. That sounds so familiar. Where did that come from? I don't Spicy know. Boys. I think it had Dude, to do I'm with sign it. I'm sign some it. kind of thing. It was. It says here's the tagline for the the petition on Change.org. It says it's 2016. There are 36 genders. Beyblade might be a new Olympic sport. Oh Why aren't we calling fire ants spicy boys? <laughs> I'm looking at the mentions of spicy boys <laughs> <laughs> and spicy boy over time <laughs> on Google Trends, and there's like. A little action around 2004. What happened on 2004 that there was a Spicy Boys? That's interesting. Was that right around like the decline of the Spice Girls? Maybe people were. I don't know. I don't know. Something happened because there's like, there's a little bit of action there. And then, uh, you know, 2016 is skyrockets. (laughs) And that's because of this petition. (laughs) Uh, Spicy Boys. Like a strange, strange name. Um, I'm not sure. How, I'm not sure if I'd want to name anything Spicy Boys, but there you go. Um, 
You know what? This is the dumb stuff that's going to keep me up at night. Now I want to know why people were talking about Spicy Boys back then, dude. I'm going to have to like research it. This is so stupid. This is so dumb. And it's going to be in my brain. This is one of your oh. most endearing qualities, Alan. It's why we have as much content on our show as that you do deep dives into information. And for our benefit, it, deep you, you know much about theology and biblical studies. But then there are those moments where something captures your interest and you fall down a hole of useless knowledge. It's and, true. Uh, and I won't come out for a week, dude. And I'll be totally disheveled when I do. <laughs> like... The world has to know about this. We have had oh, long group conversations about something where in the beginning, Alan has been interested and engaged. And there's just one thing that's been said. And then all of a sudden, Alan is disengaged from the conversation and will pop back in <laughs> occasionally with a fact about earlier. that particular thing <laughs> that happened earlier. <laughs> he just did his uh, own world. Uh, yep. And I love I'm, it. I'm looking at me spicy boys. Oh, so the the Spicy Boys were a group of f- high profile footballers, like soccer players, in the late nineteen nineties. Oh. Huh. We'll see. There we go. <laughs> but it was a but it was a pejorative. <laughs> Interesting. Alan's exercising oh, his investigative journalism I on Spicy I be Boys. Talking about this, <laughs> but they were interested in. Uh, apparently, one of the um, the uh, footballers was dating one of the Spice Girls, so they started calling all of the footballers Spicy Boys. <laughs> what I, I called that? Is. I mentioned Spice it. Girls earlier. There we go. <laughs> late nineteen nineties, two thousand four, and then it just disappeared. Like nobody said Spicy Boys anymore. Is it that Beckham that. guy? David Beckham? Or what is that what his name is? Wasn't he a soccer player? Oh, maybe not. Uh, I don't know. Is that the only soccer player you know? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's the only one. Isn't it that Beckham guy? <laughs> well, he his wife is a spice girl. That's the only reason I, Wait, I really? went there. Yeah. He, For real? Yeah. I think uh So he's like he's like a legit spicy boy. He is a legit spicy boy. And they have little spicelets. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, goes f- <laughs> full circle. That's it. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think that will uh, do it for us this week. Alan, how can people find what you have going on on the interwebs? I don't know. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> no. Always Facebook, man. Just look me up. Let's have fun. Send me a little note. Start a comment war, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Enlighten him more about <laughs> spicy boys. Yeah. Yes. Let me know who your favorite spicy boy is. And you can follow me on all the socials at Jeff Manildi and listen on the second and fourth Thursday of every month to my other podcast, Divine Cinema at divinecinema.net. And all of our personal information is here in the show notes at irenacast.com slash 107 or any number of episodes. We've added that in there as well. As for Irenicast the show, if you enjoy what we do here, recommend us to a friend or leave a rating and review for us on whatever platform you are listening on. We would really, really appreciate it. Or you can take your support of the show to the next level. Consider going to irenicast.com slash Amazon before you make your next purchase and just shop as usual. By using that link, we'll receive a small percentage of your purchase without any extra cost to you. And that'll help us a little covering the cost of some of the things associated with the podcast. That's irenicast.com slash Amazon. So for this week, I'm Jeff. I'm Alan. Thanks for joining the conversation. 